Shane at Read the Wonder. Um, I got out my, whoops, you know what, while I'm talking, I didn't even do this, that's terrible of me. While I am uh, doing this, I will tell you what I am about to do. I got out my Ura Lenormand tonight, after really kind of tossing it back and forth for maybe like a week now, just thinking about Lenormand off and on, um, it's just, it's, it seemed to come up a little bit more in the last week. So, I decided to pull it out and pull out the little Game of Hope booklet that came with it and, um, and go through the meanings. And I've done this a couple times. I've gone, I've looked at it and not this specific book, but I've looked through, you know, an, an instructive Lenormand book and looked at all the meanings, but I've not spent any real time, any real time at all, um, trying to really figure them out or figure out what they mean to me or the different meanings they have. So I was reading through them and I like it. I like the Lenormand, what I know of the Lenormand so far, in that it is, is used more for divini divinatory purposes. Div divin divinatory, is that right? Purposes. It's used more for divination. <laughs> um... Well, the tarot, a lot of people do use tarot for divination, but the tarot is is probably best at... Hey, that's my cat making a bunch of noise. Um, more at self-growth or, um, you know, really looking into things on a deeper level. It's not, in, in my opinion, it's not the best for divination, Although it definitely can be, and I have been using it for divination. I feel like Lenormand is aimed more, of course, and I've heard this from a lot of people, towards divination. So, the readings I've been doing lately online are mostly divination. And I thought, well, perhaps I should pick up the Lenormand finally. So that is my goal. But before I start that goal, I was, I was thinking of the meanings and the different meanings that each card could have. And the story that they tell, um, it seems really easy to lay down, you know, five or six Norman cards and tell a quick story there. So I thought I would do this, and I hope it's going to be fun. Keep your fingers crossed. We'll see. Um, just see how much fun this is. Obviously, it was all right if this video is up, because if it goes horribly wrong, I will just not even upload this video. 36 cards. I'm going to tell you a story with 36 cards using my um, wildly fascinating imagination. <laughs> um, that's one thing I lack, is a really strong imagination. So I'm hoping that if I do things like this, it will open that up a little bit, open up my intuition and my creativity. Are we ready? We'll see what card I pull, for, pull first. I'm gonna start the story with the first card unless We'll just see what happens. Good? I think I'm gonna hold them. This, yeah, we'll just do that. Flowers. Okay, so we'll just start by saying there was a lovely woman. And we'll have this take place around, let's do Queen Elizabeth's times, okay? Medieval England, which I know very little about. But we're gonna go with it, okay? All right, creativity. Um, there was a woman. Um, a lovely woman who had been widowed and um, she was widowed before she had any children broke her heart but she managed to keep her farm going she lived in the outskirts of <laughs> Nottingham <laughs> okay so we'll say Nottingham home Nottingham I've been struggling with this okay um, so every day at sunrise to brighten her spirits from the lonely life she had now been living she went out into the fields surrounding her little tiny home and picked some flowers. That way she could put them on her dinner table every single day and they'd be there all day to brighten it up for her, to keep her company, to, to bring her inspiration. So she would go out and pick flowers. That was a long start, huh? <clears throat> One day as she was picking these flowers, she happened to see something glinting underneath 
um, the bushes by the flowers. So she lifted the bush up and lo and behold, stuck down there was a key. She picked up the key and she thought, that's sad, I have nothing in my house, nothing at all that needs a key. So she thought, where could this key have possibly come from? And she tossed it out of her mind. <laughs> well, I can't worry about this right now. And she put it in her apron and she went inside to cook fish for dinner. <laughs> Oh, God. One, it wouldn't be dinner. She's picking flowers in the morning. So she <laughs> went, went to prepare her breakfast of fish. <laughs> so creative, guys. <laughs> Even though it was a bright and cheery day as she was picking the flowers, as she was cooking her fish, she heard a loud crack from outside. And she went outside to figure out what it was, and she realized there was a storm brewing. And there was lightning and thunder in the sky, and she thought, my God, this has come out of nowhere. The thunder cracked, and it cracked, and it roared. And she was outside just staring at it in wonderment. She couldn't believe how beautiful it was, but how frightening as well. And all of a sudden, a lightning bolt came and struck her tiny little wooden house and set it ablaze. She realized she had to have a very strong heart to get through this. <laughs> oh, this is awful, awful. Okay. So with all the heart she could muster, having lost her husband and her hope of having children with her husband, and now her home as well, with her breakfast of fish, she decided to make her way to London <laughs> for a fresh start with her proud, strong, wonderful heart. On the road, later on that day, she heard hoofbeats coming down the path. Turning behind her, she saw a man running up quickly upon her, and at first she was terrified, but he slowed down in time, came up on her very easily, and said, Madame, where are you off to all alone in this wilderness? This is no place for a young lady of such beauty. There are thieves about. And she said, well, I'm just on my way to London. I have lost everything. And my house was just burnt down by lightning. And he said, what lightning? There are no, there are no storm clouds about. I have been all over England today, and I have seen no storms in the sky. She said, well, it came upon rather quickly and left just as fast. But there goes my house, and here I am with my strong, wonderful heart. But she didn't tell him about the key. So he said, Madame, London is a very far way. How about, instead of walking, because I have no place on, for you on this horse as it's packed with all of my bags, we'll catch a ship to London on the Hillaberry River. This is fantasy. We're doing historical fantasy, guys. She said, well, that would be awfully kind of you, but I've no money. All I have, but she caught herself. She's going to say something about the key, but she decided not to. He said, no worry, madame. I am actually a sailor on his majesty's ships and they will have no problem if i bring you along for free to london so off they went and on their journey <laughs> that should have lasted an hour but um but lasted far longer for reasons she couldn't comprehend they started getting along very well and they had many deep conversations and they looked at the stars together and they held each other's hand and eventually they even kissed and then the next day only one day after she had met him he proposed and she thought this is just what i've been looking for god has sent this lightning storm so that it would carry me down this path to meet this wonderful gentleman and yes she said yes i will marry you he said all right madame off we go to london to my wonderful townhouse provided to me by queen elizabeth where you will find your new your new home. So we'll say they arrived in London and he took her straight to the home. But this man was more deceitful than he looked. For in an instant, in just 
the blink of an eye, he had changed his tune about setting foot upon setting foot in the house. He got a nasty air about him and said, Ma'am, I have not been here in months, and this needs some deep cleaning. My place is a mess, and as I've no money for servants, I will have to leave that up to you. I expect my dinner at the table at six o'clock, and I shall be home then. She felt so forlorn as he walked out the door, so despaired, so she thought that this was going to be the love of her life, everything she had been looking for. And now she was all alone in a city she didn't know anything about, in a house she hadn't set even to two paces into and she had to clean he never came home that night he never came home and she kept cleaning kept kept herself busy making dinner that went cold watching candlelights fade away for she had created quite the marvelous dinner for him and after sobbing a little bit into her hands at the kitchen table, she said, That's enough. I came here with a strong heart, and I plan on seeing it through. And she went outside and saw a beautiful array of stars. And she sat on her little porch, his little porch, or their little porch, and thought about anything and everything that could still be to come. Maybe he'll change his tune tomorrow. Maybe I will find great passion in this city. But upon those steps, without her newlywed husband, she found hope. He still had not arrived the next morning. And she thought, well, I've already done all the cleaning. I've already tidied everything up. Everything is in its proper place. And I'm not going to sit here for another second with nothing to do. So she hitched up her skirts, walked down the steps, and into the busy streets of London, where she was jostled, turned about, and frantic. She didn't know what to do, but she decided to keep pushing forward along different paths, along, along different alleyways, never knowing where she was going, but going despite her own uh, reasoning. She came upon a small, secluded park. And she entered the park, wanting to get away from the busy, lively streets of London, from the gawkers and the criers and the, and the mad people. So she went into the park, and she sat beneath the tree. It was very peaceful in this park, and nobody was around. So she decided to bring the key out of her apron again to take a closer look. All of a sudden... Through the leaves in the trees came a bright ray of sun, and it hit the key just right and blinded her. And in the vision, she saw Queen Elizabeth. And she saw Queen Elizabeth say, Come to me, Jocelyn. <laughs> Sorry, I've just decided that our lady's name is Jocelyn. She said, come to me, Jocelyn. I am waiting for you at my quarters in London, and I need your help. She opened her eyes, but the light was gone, hidden behind the tree again, and the key just looked exactly the same. But she thought, my God, Queen Elizabeth has need of me. My queen needs me, and I better get there quickly. So she left her little garden, and she started asking people everywhere. How do I get to the queen? Where is the queen residing? Where? How can I? How can I find and talk to the queen? And she just got laughed at and sneered at and booed, and nobody believed that the little peasant girl in her little white apron was looking for a queen or that the queen wanted anything to do with her. But she kept going, deeper and deeper and deeper into the city, traversing dark alleyways and unknown streets and never realizing the dangers that lurk ahead. So she slipped into an alleyway. <laughs> this is terrible. <laughs> and was snatched from behind. She should have been looking for the dangers. Quite terrible. She snatched from behind. What is this? I said I'm going to use my intuition, did I not? And she turned around quickly, escaping the snare, 
expecting to see a grisly man with a knife pointing at her throat, but instead she saw a tall, beautiful, pale, blue-eyed woman in a gorgeous evening dress <laughs> with a bouquet of roses about her. And the lady said, my dear, what are you doing here? You should not be alone in these dark alleyways of London. You never know who is lurking here. And she said, well, I am trying to find the queen, and I don't know where to find her, but I saw in my vision that the queen needs my help. And the lady, instead of looking at her in astonishment or disbelief or rudeness, said, well, my God, my dear, we need to get you there quick. For she had a very strong belief in visions. So she said, I will take you to her palace in London and I will introduce you to the queen and we shall see what sort of need she has for you, of you. And as they were traveling London, now seeming much nicer that she had a friend to walk with, they ended up intertwining arms and she told the lady all about her life and about the man that had swept her up to London and left her in such a fashion to clean a dirty, skanky house. And over time, a couple hours it took to walk to the Palace of London, they formed a deep and abiding friendship and they both knew they had found that in the other person. When they got to the palace, they waited mere moments before the queen agreed to see them, for the queen knew she was coming. And as Jocelyn walked into the palace, the queen bowed to Jocelyn. Queen Elizabeth the Mighty, who looks down to no one, bowed to Jocelyn and said, Jocelyn, I am so glad you came. Did you see my vision? And Jocelyn said, yes, yes I did. <laughs> and the queen said, thank God, because we have such a terrible problem. Down in the kitchens, they're trying to make me pastries for after tonight's dinner meal, and the rats are eating all the pastries before they can even be made. And Jocelyn said, well, <laughs> is that why you've called me here? Couldn't you have gotten anybody to do that? And Elizabeth said, Jocelyn, do you not know who you are? Did your parents not tell you? And Jocelyn said, no, I am from a small Fisher family. There's nothing special about me. And Elizabeth, Queen Elizabeth, said, well, you are the rat catcher, my dear. You are the queen's rat catcher. And Jocelyn was filled with a sense of awe about it. And she knew what her life's calling was to do, not to marry a man, not to have children, but to be the queen's rat catcher. Over the course of the next few months, she heard nothing of her newly found husband. She hung out during the day catching rats, and with her new friend Eva, who he never named, her name is Eva, hung out with Eva in the parlors and having dinner with the queen and playing dice with all the lords and ladies. And she found a home, and she found safety and security in the halls and the palaces of Queen Elizabeth catching her rats. During one of her daily traversals, she happened upon a doorway she had never seen before. She walked into a dark, dark room <laughs> where there were candles lighting a path to a great wooden statue altar. And beneath it, she saw a man in flowing red, red robes and a cardinal's hat on his head, bowing before the cross. Before she could turn around to go out and to leave him in his reverie, he quickly snapped his head back and said, Can I help you, my child? She said, Actually, sir, there is a garden around here that I had never seen before that I was just told about by young Sir Dunstan while I was playing cards. And I have no idea where it was, and I thought this might have been the entrance, but apparently it's not. And he said, you don't need a garden, child. You need God. Come up to my altar and bow before him. Beg for his mercy, his forgiveness, his compassion, and pray to be his and his alone forever. She said, no, sir, that would be the death of me. <laughs> 
I have too much respect for my Queen Elizabeth to give succor to anybody else. I cannot be, bow before anybody else's feet, save Queen Elizabeth. While the priest was just shocked, he said he, he, he could not gainsay her, for Queen Elizabeth herself had no strict religious morality. Everybody knew she was a heretic. What was he going to say to the Queen's rat catcher, for she, he knew it would get back to Queen Elizabeth? So she said, instead, sir, let me take you to this garden, only show, show me where it is, and I will pick you the most wonderful array of flowers that you have ever seen in your life, and then you can come and lay them at your Lord's feet and give thanks for the beauty of nature that he has created for you. He said, well, all right, my child, I don't agree with your ways, but I have not been to the garden in a while, and I would love a pretty bouquet from a fair young lady. So he took her to the garden. And in the garden, they found Miss Lightenheart. Miss Lightenheart. And Miss Lightenheart was known around the court for her gossip and her intrigue and her scandalous ways and her mischievousness and her cutthroat trash talking. <laughs> but feeling more emboldened than ever, um, Jocelyn strode up to Miss Miss Lighten, Lighten, Lightenhail, I don't know what I called her, Miss Lightenhail and said, Madame, don't pick that flower, and Lightenhail turned around and said, how dare you talk to me in that manner, I'll pick whatever flowers I choose, and something came over Jocelyn, and she said, too long have I been treated like this, too long have I been shoved down, and been treated at the whims and mercies of others, and she smacked Lady Nightingale, Lightenhail, right across the face and sent her sprawling onto the pavement. Well, Miss Lightenhale couldn't really withstand a knock and she was down for the count, totally passed out. The priest was appalled and said, God, what have you done? That was Miss Lightenhale. And she said, don't mind, dear sir. Let me pick you this flower and all will be well. Well, just as she was about to pick the flower, Mr. Dunkirk, who I had mentioned earlier, but I don't remember why, he is, he, she was playing dice with him earlier, came and gave her a missive, a missive, a letter, and said, this has come for you, Jocelyn, and, and I don't know where it came from, but here it is in my hands, and here I need to give it to you, and Jocelyn said, this is my first piece of mail ever at the court. This has got to be so important, whatever could it be. I uh, was very flustered. So she opened the letter, and it was from Mr. Pike. Who is Mr. Pike, we ask? Mr. Pike was her husband, the one that she had cleaned his house and left because he had not come home and had not heard from him in three whole months. And it said, Jocelyn, they will not allow me entrance to the castle, to the palace, but I need you outside immediately. You are my wife, and you are sworn to do as I command. Sweet Jesus. <laughs> and as she was... <laughs> stuck. I'm stuck. And as she was turning to go back to her quarters, her, her rooms, the priest said, where are you going? And she said, well, I'm going back to my rooms. I'm going to ignore my husband's missive. And I feel a little bit woozy from the day's events. And I need to lay down and take a rest before I just pass right out like Miss Nightingale here. And he said, she did not pass out. You struck her down. And she said, even so, I'm going to go to my room where, where I can have some bed rest. And he said, you shall not. You shall not. You need to come back. I, w I came here in the promise of a bouquet, and I have not gotten it. So you will come to my chapel yet again where I can talk to you more. And she was so tired, she couldn't even pick a flower. And two strung out, and she said, fine. Whatever can I lose? Maybe I need some Jesus. So she let the priest take her back to the, uh, the chapel, 
where he threw a Bible at her, and he said, open that to this page and read this chapter in this verse. And it says, honor thy husband. <laughs> and she said, I shall not. I shall not, for the night has called to me. There is something pulling at my skirts, at my hands, at my very soul, at this very moment. I do not need best red. I need the night. And before he could even look twice at her, she ran out of the chapel, and she ran to the highest part of the palace, up the winding staircase, and out onto the balcony, the very huge balcony, and into the night, where she looked around wildly, and finally her eyes rested on the moon, and the moon's light rained down upon, upon her, and lifted her up, and BAM! The beam of light again gave her a vision, and the vision said, there is something that you have missed in the cellars, Jocelyn. And she said, it can't have been a rat. I've caught all the rats. What do you mean? And, and the voice said, not a rat, Jocelyn. In the bottom cupboard, in the far east northern cellar, behind the rusty old books, <laughs> the rusty old books, the rusty hinges, you will find a chest. And she said, a chest? He said, yes, a treasure chest. And she said, she popped her eyes open and everything was as before. The moon still looked glorious, but there was not much light and still no voice. And she thought, well, this is ridiculous, but it sent me to Queen Elizabeth. And if it's going to send me to the cellar, I had better go. So she made her way to the cellar. Only when she had found the cellar, after passing so many other cellars, she found that it was tumbled down upon. It was entirely caved in. The doorway wasn't even traversable. She could not get beyond it. And she thought, oh my God, I have been given, I have a duty from the moon. I've been given a mission from the moon and I can't get to this chest that I, that I am supposed to open. However, am I supposed to get past this obstacle at this moment? Well, let's find out how she gets past this obstacle by a stork <laughs> by a fucking stork oh god oh god <laughs> so she began to weep because she could not figure out how in the world she was to get beyond this and she knew that if she'd asked anybody for help they would wonder why. Why in the world would you want to get into this dirty old cellar that's that's been caved in for decades? Nobody uses it. It's probably riddled with infestation. We can't go in there. So she ran into the neighboring cellar and thought, what am I to do? I am such a letdown. I'm such a letdown to the moon. And she went over to the window and cradled her head in her hands, sobbing and crying, being overrun with grief at her life. And the moon rained down again on her and said, what's wrong, my child? Where is my chest? She said, I cannot get to your chest. I do not have the strength to lift all the bricks that it would take to lift to get into that cellar. And he thought, well, just fly out the window. Just fly out the window, my dear, into the next window, into the, into the cellar. The window is still, still very clear. She said, well, sir, I cannot fly, she said to the moon. Whatever do you mean? I would die if I tried leaping from here. I am six stories high right now. And he said, just one moment. And he turned her into a stork. So she leapt from the window and spread her wings, and she flew around the castle a few times because cat was so much fun to fly. It was her dream. She wanted to fly so bad. And she found the cellar that she needed to be in, and she flew through the window and instantly transformed into Jocelyn again. And she saw the exact cupboard that he was talking about. She saw it was just a little bit ajar, and she thought that that's got to be the cupboard. She went slowly over to the cupboard. She held onto the latch, whipped it open, expecting to find dirty, old, disheveled books she saw a snake looming in front of her, <laughs> hissing at her, threatening to bite off her nose. What happens?
You're not making it easy on me, Lenormand. <sighs> Just at that moment, she heard the thunder and lightning again. Boom, boom, crack, whoosh, whoosh, outside the window. And the night sky is filled with thunder and lightning. And she could hear overhead it striking the rooftops of the palace. And she could hear the palace falling in on itself. And she thought, I've got to get this treasure chest. She grabbed the snake and whipped it across the room without fear of danger. And she pushed the books out of her way violently. And she grabbed the chest and she threw herself out the window with all the hope in the world, knowing that the moon would be there for her, or at least hoping so, and thank God he was, because she turned into a stork again and flew down safety, miles away from the castle that was falling, falling in on itself and spreading ruin over a quarter of the city. And she landed safely on the bank of a river, turning into Jocelyn again, with the treasure chest, treasure chest in her hands. And she thought, how am I gonna open this treasure chest? It's locked. She remembered just at that moment, I have a key. I have a key I've nearly forgotten about. I have not seen that key for months. Since the son told me about my, my responsibility to go see Queen Elizabeth, and she whipped out the key and put it into the treasure chest and whipped it open. And inside she found, she found a fucking house inside. <laughs> she found a tiny little wooden dollhouse inside. And she thought, God, what a letdown. What am I going to do with this little house? For if she was not expecting gold and riches to be in a treasure chest, she was at least hoping for some uh, piece of magic or, or some uh, divine object to help her in her quest for fulfillment. But instead she found a tiny little wood house. So again, because our Jocelyn likes to cry, because who wouldn't? Her life is quite a letdown, being married to an asshole and being the royal rat catcher. When a lovely young gallant man strode up to her out of the water, appearing out of nowhere, obviously appearing from the water, as I just said, and appeared out of the water, and she thought, where have you come from? Where have you come from, dear sir? And he said, well, I am from the realm of mysteries, and I believe you are holding my house. And she thought, what, what are the chances? What are the chances that, that I have been sent to find this little house, that it was in the palace, light years away, but only a couple miles, and that I have brought it to the banks of this river where this man obviously somehow resides in? And this is your house, sir. And he said, yes, I have been homeless for nearly a decade now, for somebody had stolen my house. Can I please have it back, my dear miss? And she said, well, what in the hell am I gonna do with the wooden house? And she tossed it at him and she said, have it. Everything else has gone from my life. You might as well have my little wooden house too. And he laughed gaily at her. He said, well, what's got you down? Come, come, be with me, Jocelyn. She thought, how do you know my name? And he thought, I have always, and he said, I have always known your name, Jocelyn. Come with me. And she thought, well, what the fuck? And she took hold of his hand and they started striding into the water and it got up to her ankles and it got up to her knees and to her waist and to her breasts and to her neck and she said, I cannot go any further. Where are we going? One, I cannot swim, I never learned. And two, sir, I cannot breathe underwater. And he said, yes, Jocelyn, yes, you can. And she said, well, I've, I'd have, I've had faith in the, in the sun and I've had faith in the moon. Why not have faith in this man? So together, hand in hand, they lowered their heads into the water and instantly, she felt her legs turn to mush. They felt like they just turned to mush beneath her. And she could no longer feel her feet touching the sand at the bottom of the lake. And as she looked down, she saw her feet had turned into a fin. A fucking fin. And she said, I am a mermaid. 
has always wanted to be a mermaid, and she looked next to her consort to, uh, Alquin. <laughs> to Alquin, and saw his gleaming blue and green speckled fin, and she said, well, you are a mermaid too. And he said, yes, my dear, what else did you think? No humans love it under the ocean. Only us mermen and merladies do. And she said, all right. Here we go. When they traveled to the bottom of the lake, where he set down the house in a small little square that obviously was intended for the house, and it sprang up in all sorts of directions, and it turned into a fantastical house of uh, fronds and greens and seaweeds of all different colors swaying about them, and there in the middle was a huge seashell, and there was a doorway to the seashell, and he said, come, let's have children. She thought, whoa, my dreams, my dreams are coming alive. I found the man of my dreams. I'm living under the sea as a mermaid, and I'm going to have children. At that moment, a bear jumped into the lake, and he swam down to the bottom part of the lake as fast as he could, further than a bear should ever be able to travel under a lake, and smashed their seashell house. And she said, oh, gods, whatever am I to do? <laughs> and Elkwin, standing beside her, watching the bear take his leave, flying up to the light of the ocean, lake, um, um, top, the lake top, Bear's gone. Um, picked a little four-leaf clover. That's kind of striking you. It was, it was a four-leaf clover, not a three-leaf clover, clover. Picked a four-leaf clover, and he said, Do not worry, my dear, for as long as we have each other and this clover, we will always have hope and luck on our side. And she said, Yes. But our home is smashed to bits. We have no home, and it will be very lonely under the sea without a home. And he said, yes, you're right, Jocelyn. And she said, come here, my prince. And he, this time trusting her, grabbed her hand, and she swam and swam up to the top of the lake. And she said, about a foot away from the top of the lake, she said, now we have to swim fast, and we have to lurch out of the water and he said, I'm not very good at lurching. I usually belly flop when I do that, and it hurts me very badly. And she said, my dear, trust me. And he thought, well, she trusted me to do this. So he grabbed her hand, and with all the bite of his fin, flap, 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 all the way to the top of the lake, and out they went. And as they were just about to flop, fly down, he thought, my God, this is going to be the hardest belly flop I've ever done. It's going to sting like a bitch. They both turned in. What was it? To storks. They both turned into storks. And he said, I'm flying. I'm flying. I've never flown before. And she said, I have, my dear. And it is the sweetest thing in the world. And do you know what storks are best at, my dear? And he said, what, Jocelyn? She said, for making babies. And they lived happily ever after. <laughs> Sweet Jesus. That was a little bit more difficult than I thought it would be. Went on for far longer than I thought it would. Um, <laughs> in a good, give me more time. I promise I could have done a better job. But that was definitely interesting just to see. Like, could I have done better by myself? Probably not. I'm not that imaginative. But the Lenormand definitely brought out stuff that I never would have thought of. Like, as difficult as it was, like, I never would have thought of half that shit in my life if I hadn't seen a card. So this really, I gotta get out of story talking mode. It's weird. It's weird to be talking to you guys now instead of telling a story. So, it just goes to show you what these cards can bring out of us. Not only the tarot, but Lenormand. Simple little symbols can activate our intuition on such a deep level that I can come up with bullshit like that. As bad as my storytelling skills were, it's still pretty inventive, alright? Give me that. So, 
you know, very interesting to know that yes, while they are more, they're more concrete images, more straightforward answers given, they still hold a depth that I knew was there, but I think this reassures me that, yes. Because after working and falling in love with Peril so much, I get this feeling like Lenormand just isn't going to be enough. Like, it's going to be too stark, there's not going to be enough to work with, my intuition is not going to be spiked as much, and I'm still in storytelling mode. <laughs> get out of it. And I don't feel that way so much anymore. I feel like this can tell a million different stories and for each person's situation. I could draw three cards that, yes, have, you know, pretty distinct meetings as, 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 far, as far as I know so far, you know, and they have different ones, but those same meanings pertain to different people's lives and events on such different levels and in such different ways. So that's my introduction for myself to Lenormand. That was more for, more for like, and that is a, <clears throat> this is what the cards mean in an introduction to Lenormand for you guys, but more so as a, this is going to be fun, do it with me type of thing, <laughs> like, because um, it opened my eyes to the cards a little bit more, and now in the future, I'll always look back on this, and I'll always think during readings, that was the meaning I first gave to that card, right or wrong, that is the meaning I first gave to that card, and sometimes that's what it's about and that's where intuition speaks to us i don't know why my camera's turning like that it's annoying anyway i'm gonna tag this because i have not done a tag since meet my shadow and um i think it'd be interesting to watch other people so if you have the guts to do it pull out your lenormand if you want to pull out your tarot if you want to only use half the deck only use half if you only want to use the majors in a tarot use the majors if you want to use an oracle use your oracle but try it. Give it a good shuffle. Get on camera and tell us a story intuitively, sporadically with your cards. How much fun. Like, I sincerely hope that just a couple people will do this. I will watch each and every one of them with glee. Looking forward to what kind of stories we can come up with because it's just, it is amazing what our minds can do when forced to do it, as I just was. So... Um, I look forward, hopefully, to seeing some of your tags. I look forward to it so much. Um, I hope you guys are having a great day or night, wherever you're at in that day. And um, I shall see you soon. Bye-bye.